if he's moving, it's harder to pull than a sack of cement. You follow me on that? Yeah, I, I guess I do. Sack of cement's not fighting. Yeah, Thank that's, you, no, that's true. Thank, Thank you, Brain. I'm not going to argue with you two guys. Let's get to the match, okay? Well, we were we were commentating and filibustering yeah. on Boy, it. were you ever. You got to have an opinion on the match. You just can't sit out here and uh, be thinking about that Playboy magazine that ran across us a while ago. This podcast is a member of the Place to Be Nation family. Visit us at placetobenation.com. The only place to be in your pop culture world. Uncensored, unsanctioned. Tune in, brother, because it's live and in color. No rules, no regulations. He can't handle me. No more Mr. Nice Guy, brother. It ain't nothing to it but to do it. And tonight, you're going to get done. The fear is here. The fear is there. Well, Hulk Hogan was born at night, but not last night, brother. Am I going to walk off? Is it a sunset? Think of my forever? No! I become the man what's that? And as we see this redneck town is going to be obliviated if you understand what I'm saying. Grab your plunder and open the pay window. It's time for Survey Says. Hogan, we're coming your way. Woo! Woo! Welcome, everyone to WCW Survey Says, where we are live tonight from Tupelo, Mississippi, the Tupelo Coliseum Concession Stand, and the floor is rather sticky here. Uh, We'll we'll actually wish that was the case later tonight. More on that later. uh, I'm noticing Jerry Sags, he's he's passed out under, under a crate of funnel Funnel cakes, I do believe. And off to the corner there, it looks like we've got Klondike Bill <laughs> chewing on a pair of, of panties, which uh, which is apropos. And who is this? Oh, it's uh, uh it's this is Mike Tanay. He's he's going head first into the into the hot dog flavored water. Uh, well, be that as it may, I am Tim Capel. Joined, as always, by my co-captain. He is the macho man, Andy Savage. Helene, Andy, how are you doing tonight? Well, I'm wishing I'd brought a clean uh, change of pants because I got mustard all over them. Ooh, well, um, don't let Klondike Bill know that. That's that's too great taste for him, at least, that, that probably go great together. So that could be a little bit dodgy here on this evening. But in any case, you may be wondering what, what we're doing here tonight. And we're, we're going to have a fun show. This, this is going to be a little bit, a little bit off the wall, but, but so, is, so is our topic tonight. Because we're going to be talking WCW Uncensored. How do you like that, Andy? It's, uh, it's another pay-per-view retrospective, which... I think we haven't we haven't done it in a while, have we? Yeah, it's uh, unsanctioned and uncooked like these hot dogs. <laughs> the, these hot dogs are definitely unsanctioned. This show, unsanctioned as well on Place to Be Nation Wrestling. Beyond that, I mean, what what else is there to say except we're uncensored? <laughs> or what's that commercial? It's like every time I keep thinking of that commercial, I get the Lucky Charm stuck. To- um, stuff in my head like hearts, stars, horseshoes. Uh, <laughs> like rolls I, are for fools. Yeah, I think he does say heart or something like Bret Hart. He does. And he, so then he's like filled... running through all the nicknames and and the the gimmicks and stuff. Yeah. yeah. But then <laughs> yeah. I think my head fills in the Lucky charm stuff. Once I say <laughs> hearts, it just goes like maybe I'm stuck on food. So it's horseshoes. <laughs> what are some of the Lucky Charms? flavors and marshmallows they they kind of did run through the list didn't they <laughs> yeah uh that that was i guess the official uh wcw uncensored rap <laughs> there were the these oh some of these promos were um kind of an event unto themselves but um in any case let's not waste any time here let's let's get right into it we're we're, we're we're just going to start running through these, and, and we're not going to go crazy with with 
or, match, whoa, whoa, whoa. matches and star ratings because that's that's not what we are here on Survey Says. If you've ever heard one of our shows before, you know how we do things here. We're, we're just going to try to have fun with it, I think. Yeah, but one thing, should we take care of the business that we have before we get into the proper we, show? We do have a little bit of business and do a little housekeeping here on Survey Says. You've got some plunder with you, as I understand. Once again, apropos of, of this episode, you don't have any farm implements, but, but you do have some gimmicks. So, so let's get into that. Each episode, I always give a shout out to my buddy, Kurt Kilberg. He's like a spiritual third member of this um, show now, because I mentioned him like so much. Or he could be like Norm's wife, you know, who's <laughs> you always hear about, but you never, never seen. Never seen, but all, often spoken of, yes. <laughs> uh, but now, he actually sent us fan mail, which I think is pretty cool. He sent me things in the past, because I think I mentioned like um, he sent me WCW uh, trading cards before, and I opened them. And talked about him on the show. But now I thought he actually sent me something and it said, care of survey says. So I thought this is actually legit fan mail. So I'll just uh, save it for the next time we get together to record. And here's the letter right here. And I'll actually So you got it. an actual physical letter in the mail. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I think it's a card inside this envelope. Um, but I thought I'd just wait and open it up on the show and like tell you. So here, I'm opening it up now. Oh, yeah. Hold it up to the mic. Let's let's do this. We're live, folks. Oh, man. He sent um, a Valentine, and I think it's from Star Wars. It says, you're a winner, Valentine, and it's got the young Anakin, like in the pod race. Okay. And I think how it relates to WCW is he put a WCW uh, sticker on it. Oh. And it's the... Um, 99 logo, like the redesigned one. That's... Oh, the uh, as as Tony Schiavone describes it, the exploding vagina logo. <laughs> yeah, so it says, on the back it says, uh, to the survey says crew, and then I guess there's something inside. So there's actually something inside this little pouch almost. Oh, man, it's a Valentine uh, with DDP. Oh, near and dear to our hearts. Um, yeah, so he's like pointing or something, and he's like doing the diamond sign, um, the okay. diamond cutter sign, and it says, um, to the survey says crew from Kurt, the Jawas Kilberg. Because as you remember, oh, on the blog of Doom, he was Jawas. Yes. Uh, as we met Kurt on, on the blog where we met back in the day, he was known as the Jawas. So I guess in keeping with the Star Wars theme and uh, – yeah, and, and keeping with our theme here on Survey Says, we've got DDP, and you know, for Valentine's Day, he he has the the exploding vagina logo. So <laughs> I think we've checked all the boxes there. This is tremendous. Yeah. So thanks, Kurt. I guess this gets you a spot now in the Fan of the Month Club. You are officially our Fan of the Month for this episode. Oh my gosh! So. Right there, we have it. A, and a new inductee into the WCW Survey Says Fan of the Month Club, which is, is a very special accolade and very surprising to me as well that, that Kurt Kilberg has, has not been inducted prior to this edition. But uh, as you said, he, he's a very uh, frequent presence on, on our program here, uh, contractually obligated shout-outs. Uh, as we've done, so now he he makes it into, I guess our our kind of unofficial Hall of Fame. Yeah. Um. So thank you, Kurt. On that note, I I would just like to point out we um, b- because I I think I'll be called out on it later if, if I don't at, at least acknowledge this. We only induct one fan of the month per show, and and that's that's not going to change with this episode. But there is another fan who. I have been in contact with. Oh, really? Did I just kind of yeah. um, overstep the uh, no, theme of the month? You did not at all. I, I, this was I, I wanted to um, to just sort of test the waters here and, and just put put it out there that uh, I have been in contact with someone who has listened to all of our episodes and um, it's kind of chomping at the bit here to to get into our illustrious rankings in the fan of the month club and. 
no doubt is a future inductee, but just maybe missed the cutoff this month. But um, if you're listening, I, you certainly know who you are, and, and we can talk about that that offline. But um, believe me, your, your day will come. And uh, that's, I think, all I'll, I'll say on that. I, I don't want to, again, spoil too much or, or, you know, make it seem as though I, I'm trying to induct two listeners here into our, our Fan of the Month Club because that's that's just not how we roll here on Survey Says. Please tell me it's Ralphus, please. <laughs> oh, wow. If it was Ralphus, that, that would really be, you know, maybe maybe it's Ralphus. Who I've, maybe I've been talking to Ralphus on Twitter. He's been, you've been uh, holding out. You've been holding out. You didn't tell me until now. Yeah, still... he's he's sliding into my DMs. He's he's a huge huge fan of the show. So it could be Ralphus. Now it could be Ralphus. It could be Norman Smiley. Um, gosh, it 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 could be it, it could be the the Kiss Demon, um, um, Ricky Rackman. Uh, it might be Ricky. It might be Ricky Rackman. It might be DJ Rand. You, just, you have no idea. I mean, so many possibilities here. It, it gosh, I just, again, I, I don't want to give too much away and, and show my hand here. Um, <laughs> hey, you know, it, it might be Scotty Riggs for all we know. We will advance from that. With that bit of business concluded, should we get into our show proper now? We'll be doing this chronologically, but you know, keep things chugging along here and try to keep this fun in the spirit of things WCW. Uncensored, 1995. This took place on March 19th, 1995. Again, hailed from Tupelo, Mississippi in the Tupelo Coliseum. This, of course, being the inaugural WCW Uncensored. Kind of a new, interesting cool uh concept high concept type pay-per-view we've talked about these things in the past i think it was about just about a year ago we we dedicated an entire episode to the very different sort of unique uh shows that that wcw would try to produce in order to stand out from the crowd we might have touched on Uncensored a little bit on that show, but, but didn't get into it, uh, certainly to the extent we will here. But Uncensored, right along those lines, where the idea is, I mean, it's basically a bunch of gimmick matches, right? It's, it's, um, it's, it's Uncensored! <laughs> well, I, I have something to add, though, because I'd always kind of thought... Or maybe it was like um, reading reviews, and it kind of like changed my perception of Uncensored. But going back and rewatching all those shows with '95, I almost want to say that their attempt uh, to do um, gimmick matches was actually better than the WWF. Maybe I'm going kind of really out on a limb here or something, but it seems like whenever, or at least recently, it seems like whenever WWF or WWE they do a gimmick match, like the one they go to the most is a ladder match because they're always having like the Money in the Bank ladder match or just regular ladder matches, and they do it kind of to death. And then even when they do like the TLC uh, pay-per-view, it's tables, ladders, and chairs. Mm -hmm. Then when they would do the Extreme Rules, they do ladders, and they would do like kendo stick matches, or they do like strap matches and stuff. But going back to this 1995 show, I guess ladder matches were pretty like new and they hadn't done any yet, but so they kind of took a different approach and they're like, all right, well, we have wrestlers that are boxers or who can do <laughs> karate. So we'll kind of, and we'll kind of mash up the two different guys and kind of do like a different thing like that. So it seemed to me like maybe they were having fun with it and maybe they kind of went like way too far with the concept like maybe they kind of tried uh, too hard, um, but I thought, hey, at least they were trying, and so it kind of won me over that way. You know, they at least made an attempt. Yeah, to yeah kind of well, do... I don't know how many um, boxer versus wrestler matches the WWF had. You're you're definitely right about or well, King they of did the, road the Roddy Piper. Oh, true. Yeah, the King of the Road thing. But uh, like, but yeah, they did. 
Oh, what? Roddy Piper and Mr. T. That one's super famous, like the boxing. Well, that was actually a boxing match, not boxing. It was just a boxing match. It was wrestler. Yeah. Yeah, this is a uh, boxer versus wrestler. And, and of course, the, the, the martial arts match. So that's, that's something that was um, pretty much uh, uh, limited to <laughs> WCW and, and their early efforts here with uh, the all-gimmicked pay-per-view. But, but you're right in, in the sense that it, it's a little bit ahead of its time in some way. Um, we've also talked about how it seemed like for the longest time, WCW was the promotion that had more pay-per-views than the WWF in a calendar year. And then sort of all of a sudden, uh, in this very year, 1995, the WWF decided they were going to do 12 pay-per-views, one for every month, and they introduced the the in-your-house concept, and they kind of leaped ahead of WCW on the paper on the pay-per-view front. So WCW responded by adding more shows to their calendar, but they still weren't running as many as the WWF. So this was kind of an interesting response to that. Um, I don't know how much advanced planning or advanced warning they had that they needed to kind of fire back here. And they were sort of in, in a more defensive position for a change on the uh, pay-per-view front. Um, but in a lot of ways, this feels like as much a response to the WWF as it is WECW, excuse me. You know, we were talking about on our look back on 1994, how, you know, they ran Slamboree in Philly and had the, uh, the ECW mutants, so to speak, and were kind of uh, trying to adjust their their show and their booking to that crowd. And here again, I, I feel like they're they're trying to do something more in the vein of what's considered quote unquote. I, I'm doing air quotes here. Extreme for 1995. So, so you get a little bit of that as well. Yeah, you know, um, I never actually considered that uh, this would be their response to ECW, but you're all right because, um, yeah, you, like you bring up uh, the show we recorded with Andrew Reich on Spring Stampede and Slamboree from 94. And, yeah, this does kind of actually, now that you put it in that kind of perspective, it does seem like it's their reaction to ECW, whereas maybe their um, reaction to the WWF would be then – bringing back uh, the Great American Bash, because that hadn't been a pay-per-view uh, since 1992. And I guess we can get into that in a whole nother show, so um, we can just leave sure. that there. But that... Yeah, no, I, I could see that as well. Um, and I, I feel like, not that ECW would have necessarily been, been considered a threat to them, but they could be perceived as maybe more cutting-edge than... WCW certainly was perceived at the time, so it would make sense to to go down that route a little bit more. Um, having said that, you will not see blood on this show. Nope, that's Blading. just ketchup from the hot dog stand. Just yeah, just ketchup from from the uh, the Tupelo concession stand. It's funny because shortly before this this show, I I was kind of reading up on the background a little bit. And Dr. Harvey Schiller had become, I guess, president, I'm not sure what the official title was, of TBS Sports. And WCW was moved under the purview of, of TBS Sports and Dr. Harvey Schiller from uh, Bill Shaw, who had kind of been the, the man in charge for a while. And... Harvey Schiller wanted to take the promotion in a direction that was more kind of kid-centric, kid-friendly. And the very first sort of edict he handed down was no more blood. N not that WCW was really known for that kind of thing, but it would happen. And when it did, it was sort of like, eh, whatever, it's wrestling. Starting kind of officially here with his tenure, it was like, no, that is not going to happen anymore under my watch. 
And it just so happens that the show that is going to be most impacted by that is one called WCW Uncensored. <laughs> so a little bit ironic and unfortunate in, in that respect. Well, um, even in the first match, because didn't I know. they say that Dustin and then uh, the Blacktop Bully, uh, they both got fired because they bladed. That's right. In the uh, in the aforementioned King of the Road match with with Dustin Rhodes and the Blacktop Bully, they and this is what kills me. Okay, so for starters, uh, this was this match was pre taped, right? So you would think if they blade, which they're not supposed to do, but they do blade. Okay, that's a big no no. But at least it's a pre taped match. We can edit around that. We can edit that out so that you don't see it, so that for all appearances, it, it didn't happen. And yet, <laughs> the way this match is edited, you do see that, and it's kind of all over the place, and it's and it's editing. Did, did you notice the, the way this was put together? It sort of goes between daytime and, and sort of sundown, back and forth a couple of different times <laughs> it's like the wrestling version of like plan nine from outer space because i think when i've watched that it's like yeah they're like driving it's like daylight or something and they get somewhere and it's like dark and then it yeah. reverses when they're going somewhere else it's <laughs> great i think um i think dustin loses his shirt at one point and then it reappears and then he loses it again <laughs> The, the one thing that I want to say about this match is that when I was watching it again, like I had this one thought, and like right as soon as it popped in my head, Bobby Heenan said it. I was like, oh my God, there's like trailer parks and stuff. And he, he just totally like <laughs> brought up the trailer parks. Like I forget what he says, but then later on, like he mentions it again, and he's like, yep, yeah, we must be in downtown Tupelo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like some of Tupelo's finest must live there, something like that. Yeah. And this is when Bobby Heenan is like still trying. He was always entertaining, even even when he was having an off night. You know, even when he had just thrown in the towel on on wrestling and on WCW, he was always still entertaining. But here, he's still like the Bobby Heenan that that you remember. You yeah. know, I guess you but could yeah. say Bobby Heenan maybe was like half assing it. But I think with Tony Schiavone, even here, you know, he's having fun. You yeah, know, just, I don't think he was half assing it here. I, yeah. I think he was still pretty engaged. Yeah. God. One other thing that popped in my head, I guess I kind of went into this big like thought. This had to be like logistically like a nightmare because Oh yeah. They'd have to what? Like I don't know what goes into this and I didn't um look up anything online, but I was just like thinking, well shit, wouldn't they have to like I guess notify people to close off the road or hey, we're going to have this, like, truck, and people are going to be wrestling in it, so they have to, like, block off the road, or, or you have the cops, like, you know, drive, like, in the big convoy thing. And then they've also got to have that helicopter or something flying around to film it. It seems like for as poor planned as WCW is, this is, like, the opposite. They would have had to do, like, a lot to pull that off. So, I was thinking the exact same thing, that... This was like super ambitious. Just the variety of shots and the the different angles that they were getting and how much time it must have taken to film this, you know. Maybe they didn't plan it so well again with with the sun going down. I imagine the director's director or whoever whoever's in charge of this production is just shitting their pants because they're running out of daylight and they probably did not anticipate or, or plan for that. Maybe they thought this was going to be a shorter shoot and yeah. bit off more than they could chew. And as it's getting dark, I mean, there's nothing you can do at that point. <laughs> if you're not prepared to deal with a nighttime shoot, um, and then it, that, like we said, in the finished product, it, it goes back to the, just the cutting back and forth where it's, it's very obvious. Yeah. Maybe the truck like ran out of gas. So they had to like <laughs> fill it up. So that's why it's suddenly night or not night, maybe but like, you know, dusk or something is cause they had to stop. Oh shit. We still got more to film. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? And I mean, and they're doing pile drivers and, and 
suplexes uh, on on bales of hay and shit in the in the back of this this uh, sort of flatbed truck that that's got sort of a cage built up around it. It's just you can't describe it as a good match at all, or even apply like a star system or rating to it. It's something you just have to see at least once to, to know what you're looking at. You can't really describe this thing and do it justice. It's not bad. Like the match wasn't really that bad given the circumstances, like we're saying, and a lot of these matches like on this whole show, they're almost the same way. They're kind of like, weird like mashups you know like the karate Mm -hmm. and the wrestler or something it's like it (laughs) sounds bad but they at least pulled it off to make it somewhat entertaining whereas it could have been like dull as shit well the aforementioned karate the martial arts match with with jim duggan and ming all i have to say about that is is the beginning of the match as they bow to one another i know you enjoy that as (laughs) that's as a Fan of all things absurd, like I am. I've been holding this thought in for two years now because I've wanted to say this from the moment that we decided to record a podcast. I about died laughing when they kept doing the bowing thing, and they're like, okay, and Sonny Bono's like, okay, Duggan, you got to bow, and he's not having any of it, and then like Ming just kicks him <laughs> in the head. I was like, yes. I was like, Hacksaw Jim Duggan is a dick. <laughs> <laughs> That was my my sole note for this match. Uh, Jim Duggan is a cunt. <laughs> so <laughs> I wrote down for that one. This is a show that that very much feels like part of the the Eric Bischoff WCW, in that visually it's it's pretty appealing. Like I think Bischoff knows what looks good on television, so. It looks kind of top-notch. The problem is that the sort of overall production and the direction especially is is what lets this down. At at the same time, we we have things like uh, Avalanche versus Macho Man Randy Savage ending in a (laughs) disqualification in a no-DQ match. So that's somewhat unique. (laughs) The, the the boxer versus wrestler match, which, you know, is interesting in its own right, but um, I don't know. I, I think overall this is a – this was kind of a, a worthwhile experiment for the promotion to do um, and surprisingly was, was very successful for them. I, I had read, actually, that based on the buy rate and just the revenues that they, they collected – uh, on this show, it was their most successful pay per view to date. Oh, as wow. of yeah, as of uh, March of of 1995. So that was definitely a revelation to me uh, heading into this. Um, any other thoughts on 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 95 here? I, you know, we don't want to go match by match, of course, but uh, oh, I we could. could certainly do our I best could. of yeah. and worst of. <laughs> First off about this show is that I've said that I like the matches and I was entertained by them. Maybe they were kind of bad, but they were at least entertaining crap. But the best thing about this show was all of the videos and the interviews between each match. It actually flowed pretty well. There was match Mm. and then they were backstage or there was a match and they showed like a promo video hyping a match. And then, you know, so on. They repeated that. And there was mm-hmm. one later on where they had Harlem Heat. And they're like, okay, we're going to show this Harlem Heat video. And it was a good video package of them beating up people. But the music, I think they dubbed over it with some, it sounded like from Seinfeld or like a Seinfeld knockoff. <laughs> it's like, doo, 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 doo. Back in November at the Clash of the Champions, Sister Sherry was discovered as the longtime secret on the phone as she helped the Harlem Heat defeat the Nasty Boy. I don't know. But then <laughs> some there, of those dubs are really obvious. You're right. And then they even had a really good 
really intense promo with Ric Flair and Vader, like later on, like before the main event. They were really intense, and I think Vader like talks, and Ric Flair takes over, and Vader like leaves the set. But then all of a sudden, I think you see like a chair fly behind Ric Flair, and Vader comes back, and he's like yelling, and he's like, "It's uncensored," uh. and he's even doing the woo. he's even doing the woo with Flair's like woo, and Vader's like ooh. <laughs> they were going back and forth, and it was hilarious. I loved all those videos. It's kind of like the same thing with Funk from the Slamboree show, how he's like totally intense, but he's like saying the most ridiculous stuff, but he's like really selling it. So he's really straddling the line, like Flair and Funk and Vader. They're doing the same thing. They're really straddling the line of like comedy and like yeah. absurdity, but they're actually like a really good, and even Flair in that promo too. He's. He dressed up like a woman for his run-in, and then he still has, like, well, he's uh, talking with Vader. He's still got eyeliner on. I notice he's got nail polish on. So he actually seriously did dress up like a woman, and he didn't just, like, half-ass it and put on dress. No. He, like, no. went, like, the full Monty, I guess, um, you could say. Yeah, that. this this was the uh, the debut of uh, Ric Flair in, in drag, interfering in that, that aforementioned Randy Savage and Avalanche match. I kind of thought he looked like a somewhat younger B. Arthur. So <laughs> had had that flavor going on. Maybe? I think we've even talked about that before, where he had like the grandma haircut, you know? The, the, <laughs> the, 1990, the mid-90s uh, uh, grandma bus driver type haircut <laughs> kind of serves him well. And uh, in that regard, but you're right. I mean, he has the makeup on for for the duration of of his appearance here at, at Uncensored. So that uh, I mean, talk about a, an unusual uh, visual aesthetic that that is presented, no doubt. That's not even not to step on your toes here, but no, please. That's not even the best promo. I've talked about the Harlem Heat one, now Flair and Vader, but the best one is Arn Anderson. I was in love with this promo. And um, I've even got a little clip. I'll try to, like, play a little clip right now. Okay. I've stomped. I've kicked a lot of mud holes in the backside of a lot of opponents. Burn my face into your memory. It's going to be there long as I want it to be. The ring is my home. When I'm in the ring, I'm the master of it. And anybody else that's in there with me. I'm Arn Anderson, world television champion. That's badass. Burn my face into your memory. It's going to be there as long as I want it to be. I mean, that is that is a bad motherfucker. That's so why he, I picked that part of the clip, because I like that, where he's like, burn my face into your memory, be there as long as I want it to be. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's believable, you know, coming from him. I mean, we, we've talked about Arn Anderson being like sort of the middle-aged dad type, but he could cut a damn intense promo and, and back it up too. And, uh, at the time he's, he's in the stud stable, right. With, uh, with Colonel Rob Parker, which was sort of a departure from him. You know, you always associate him with, with flair and, and with the horsemen, but this is a little bit different. I mean, he had, he did the dangerous Alliance as well, but, um, this is altogether a, a different experience with uh, the, the stud stable, which sort of comes apart af after this show. But, um, I mean, for a while there, that was um, that was a pretty big going concern for WCW and, and uh, Rob Parker as, as manager. So, and and we'll, we'll see a little bit more of him later on as, as we progress through this. Yeah, because the thing about that Arn Anderson video... It almost seemed like he wasn't doing an interview. It was just like, like he said a catchphrase, and it showed a clip of him doing a spine buster. And then it was mm -hmm. more catchphrases and stuff. And then some of them were kind of cool where he says a phrase or something, and he's like looking in his reflection in his pickup truck. And then it cuts back to him again, and he's like looking at the camera pointing. And it kind of reminded me of like, even when I was recording it to get the little sound bite and use it just now, he says he was stomping mud holes. And what I thought when I first saw this uh, as part of the show, it reminded me of in 97, where after uh, Steve Austin, you know, he was taken out with the pile driver and was on the shelf for a while and wasn't wrestling. He did like a promo or an interview from his ranch or something in Texas. He wasn't with his truck, but I think he was like, had Owen's face on like a, 
and was using it for target practice, and he was shooting like arrows at it or something. And it reminded me of this, like Arn was doing the same thing, like the intense promo out, you know, in the country. And then now listening to it again, he says the mud hole thing. So it's like, it's pretty obvious. I think Austin like might have used Arn as a little bit of an influence. I think so. Yeah, he he might have been a little bit of a fan. That's that's pretty cool. I I never thought of that or made that connection. So might be onto something there. Yeah. Anything else you want to get into there? Um, we basically talked about the entire card so far. The one thing I wanted to say is like we haven't talked about my favorite match or like what I would say was like my favorite from the show was actually the okay. strap match. Maybe it's because I think on our Super Brawl show where we talked about the previous match with Vader and Hogan, I liked it, but mm-hmm. I hated it at the same time because. I think I was thinking ahead to the next couple pay-per-views because there's four in a row where it's Vader Hogan in some different type of match. And um, mm-hmm. Vader always loses. And I was like, well, why wouldn't they give Vader like a win or something or at least let him win? And I think now I'd gotten that out of my system and I was just like, okay, I'm just going to sit back and I'm going to enjoy this like strap match. And I wasn't really like looking at it in some kind of marky or like snarky way or something. I loved it. It was like Vader did like, take a lot of uh, offense from Hogan. It almost seemed to me like it was two matches at once because you had what was going on in the ring with uh, Vader and Hogan. And on the outside, you had like another match because Flair kept – like he'd try to go uh, hit the Renegade, and the Renegade would like pose and like scream at him, and Flair would like run away, or Flair <laughs> would try to run into the ring, and the Renegade <laughs> would cut him off. And so, yeah, it seemed like a comedy match on the outside. Then you had the strap match on the inside, and then they kind of like – I think bled into each other and it was just it was entertaining like i don't know if you felt the same way or not but no that's that's true it, it was kind of a, a tale of two matches where it, it sort of um vacillated between really intense and a little bit of comedy at the same time i mean talk about rick flair and drag uh and and still having the the nail polish and the the eyeliner on as he interfered into this match and it's funny because the finish still keeps Vader pretty protected because it's <laughs> it's Hogan like um, pinning Flair, <laughs> which <laughs> doesn't really work because Flair's not in the match at all. Like he, he's in no way a a competitor or performer in this match. But okay, we'll we'll just roll with that. We're uncensored. <laughs> And, and that's just that's just how it ends. It's like, all right, well, I guess that's a that's a creative way to keep your your biggest heel protected. I, I guess um, I do think it was a little bit of a missed opportunity. I mean, we saw Flair and Drag earlier in the show, and the object of the strap match is is to drag your opponent, drag your opponent to all four corners of the ring, right? And uh, I don't know, there, there's just something kind of uh, thematically appropriate maybe about Hogan dragging Flair and drag himself <laughs> across the ring. And it, it didn't really happen. Flair's not in drag at this point. Yeah. So, oh well, I, I guess the, the point um, still is there and speaks for itself. You know, my favorite match from from this card was actually the uh, the boxer versus wrestler match of Arn Anderson versus uh, Johnny B. Mediocre, only because it was sort of a showcase for for Arn Anderson. It made Johnny B. Bad look like sort of a dumbass for even taking this match when he, he talks about in his pre match promo how much of a disadvantage he is at here. I mean, all he can do is box and Arn is free to do whatever he wants in his capacity as a professional wrestler. And it's just Arn kicking the shit out of Johnny V. Bad for, you know, the better part of, of 10, 15 minutes um, before, before Johnny rallies at the end cheats to win. But here again, that's, you know, we know what, what's on the marquee here. So I'll forgive it. It was an entertaining little match, I thought. So I, I got a way more enjoyment out of that than, than I was expecting, especially as someone who, who kind of marks out for just Arn Anderson being a badass. 
Oh yeah, I liked it too. That's why it was hard to kind of say like my favorite was Vader versus Hogan. Like it was just if I picked one, but as I said, like I liked basically everything on this on a show. There really wasn't anything that was totally bad. Well, what didn't you like? What was your least favorite match, even if it wasn't totally bad? Well, we've already kind of talked about it, and we're sitting in the aftermath of it uh, with uh, mustard (laughs) on my pants. But yeah, it was the tornado (laughs) tag match. It seemed like uh, they were almost like trying to redo uh, the Nasty Boys and like Cactus Jack and do like a wild brawl, but it seemed like they were trying to do that, but they weren't really successful. If that makes any sense, it does. I mean, as a match, it's it's atrocious. I mean, it's it's terrible, but it's kind of both the worst and the best match on the show. I felt like because it's it's so watchable and just that train wreck sort of way. Um, <laughs> there is one thing I want to say though that I meant to write it down because I wrote down, I jotted down some notes. I guess I forgot to write this down, but it popped in my head now as there was one part where, like, I think one of the nasty boys on the ground and, and C.E. Ray grabs this whole sheet thing of cotton candy and just kind of, like, rubs it on the nasty boys guy's back. And that's all he does. And you know what? He just kind of rubs him, rubs it on him and then <laughs> scratching his back. That, yeah, that. and that's really the match in a nutshell. As soon as it goes backstage, it just completely falls apart. And they're doing this, like, concession stand brawl. Um, a bunch of soda or something gets spilled, and you can tell that the floor is just, you can't even walk on it. They keep slipping and sliding. And I, personally, am such a big fan of just pratfalls, of, of people, like, <laughs> falling and busting their asses, that I was dying watching this match. I mean, there were so many times that just somebody does something clumsy and falls and, and looks like an idiot. Um including Sherry, although props to to Sister Sherry here, who on heels probably had had the best showing just getting around in this this oil slick that the floor had become. Uh, I mean, she does fall once and bust her ass pretty good. (laughs) But for the most part, she kind of kept it together uh, in a way that the... uh, the the actual participants in in this match did not so uh, that that was pretty special to me. I mean, it's one of those things I, I could watch over and over and still be just as entertained and amused by. But I mean, it is a nothing match. They don't even catch the the pin on camera, and I mean, it it's just like all of a sudden the bell rings and the match is over, and you think. Uh, maybe the the referee just threw this out because you know they had completely lost control. Oh no, they just didn't catch the pen on camera. <laughs> That's all. I think that about ties a bow on on 1995. Roll right along here. They did this again, I guess, because it was so successful for them in '96. So you had the second WCW uncensored once again in the Tupelo Coliseum on March 24th of 1996. And this show is a little bit, um, I want to call it a little bit more polished, but in some ways wasn't totally as, as entertaining to me as, as 1995, even though, again, it was maybe more polished and perhaps more competent. Uh, what do you think, Andy? Well, I guess you're right because, they did take up a lot of guys in the main event because Hogan and Savage versus a whole bunch of bad guys. So they were already um, using up a lot of guys for one match. And so maybe mm. uh, the undercard was a little bit light. I think they tried to go pretty hard with all the gimmicks on this one, too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And maybe yeah, we're definitely. a little bit less uh, successful than 95. But it was still an entertaining show, I thought. Here we do have that that main event, the rather infamous Doomsday Cage match. People really dog this this main event a lot, and and I totally see why. Um, but if you look at it in terms of it's, I I went into this viewing it as like it's it's like Superman and Batman versus their entire Rogues Gallery. If you're maybe uninitiated or or 
less than initiated as a wrestling fan, maybe a younger wrestling fan, you could like totally buy into this as the biggest match of all time that had ever taken place ever. Do you think that's fair? Like I said before on previous shows, I was more into the World Wrestling Federation, but I do remember at the time, because I'm having friends in school, uh, that they had said it was going to be like Hulk Hogan and the Macho Man like teaming up against all these guys, and they even like brought in like a uh, Zeus as the Z Gangster. <laughs> and so it does seem like like what you're saying, the Rogues Gallery, because they're even digging back and getting an old Hogan villain from the late '80s and stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty much everybody short of like King Kong Bundy or something. Yeah. No. Yeah. No doubt. And I mean, the match doesn't really deliver. It just seems like the perception around it could could definitely be that. And maybe it was dulled a little bit by just the fact that in early 1996, WCW was not really on the map as like the major wrestling promotion. You know, the brand was still the WWF when you thought of wrestling. So maybe just in terms of, of trying to market this, that may have hurt it. But that was something I was very interested in just, if you had any impressions at the time as a wrestling fan, because that's something I I really didn't get. 1996 was still too early for me in terms of wrestling and and what I was watching. I was very dialed out. As a match, it is pretty rough. (laughs) You know, it's kind of forced and, and just contrived. It's like you've got all these dudes and you're not using them at all. That's what the match gets dogged for, but it's not what they did, really. I mean, they didn't put them over. It's not like they're pinning all these guys left and right. It's they're, For the most part, they're trying to um, avoid the, the heels in various different creative ways. Yes, that's the exact point that I was just going to make. I had always thought that that's what it was. It was Hogan and Savage versus all these bad guys, and it was going to be like an elimination match. They were just in basically like the Thunder Cage uh, mm-hmm. thing. So that's kind of what I envisioned in my head. And then they'd just be pinning everybody and then eliminating them until they got down and maybe like Sullivan was the last guy. But no, that wasn't even the case. It was like uh, the whole uh, cage thing was this big structure by the entrance ramp. And it's like a big, it's more like ended up being like a haunted house. They had bad guys <laughs> in each room and they went through to the haunted house and it took me out of it because I'm like, so like barbarian or whatever is just like standing in this one like chain linked room for a while while everybody else was fighting in these other rooms and it was kind of stupid and I was like man I hate this but then like Luger being a heel like he just basically said fuck it I'm just going to go fight him anyways and so that was kind of entertaining in a ways. Yeah I I think we both have sort of the same read on this and you said haunted house I was thinking like amusement park (laughs) funhouse the the way this was laid out was going through my head watching this Uh, there's just like it's not just the fact that it's this uh, sort of triple-decker cage, um, which is uh, uh, quite something in and of itself, but it's got all these different compartments and, and trap doors and entrances and exits and, and all this shit. And it, Like I said, you've got Barbarian and Ming sort of trapped in the Hall of Mirrors over here in the corner <laughs> <laughs> as Hogan is just sneaking his way around. Um and, and by the way, uh, the faces are, are throwing powder and the heels and, and pulling out all these, these different stops to, to gain an advantage. And then like frying pans and stuff, right? The frying pans come into play. You got the booty man running <laughs> at the end. Who, he's maybe, I don't know what, Aquaman to uh, <laughs> Hogan and, and Savage's uh, Superman and, and Batman. And, and Savage gets the, the win. He just sneaks it out. Which was hilarious because the finish comes when Luger with, I guess, a loaded glove, supposedly, or, or as we're told on commentary, goes to hit Macho Man, who Flair is, is holding, and Savage very clearly ducks out of the way, like in plenty of time, and Luger starts to pull his punch, but... The finish, I guess, is supposed to be him knocking out Flair. So he not only pulls his punch, he pauses, grabs Flair by the head, and very deliberately hits him, and then acts like it was an accident. 
<laughs> and and Savage starts to run out of the cage and then runs back in to pin. Fl- I mean, it was such a clusterfuck. It was hilarious. <laughs> I mean, I just, I died laughing at that. I was like, I cannot believe, number one, that this happened, but that was the actual finish. On that note, so what do you have as your best match on this show? As much as I don't like uh, Conan, um, I liked his match with Eddie Guerrero, but I liked the Belfast Bruiser and the Lord Steven Regal match. I thought that was really intense and it was pretty good. Yeah, that was crazy stiff. I I definitely would have that as as my favorite match too. Really more than than you'd probably seen from Steve Regal at that time where he's portraying kind of this prim and proper sort of I mean, let's face it, kind of a pussy type of wrestler. And here he's like taken to the limit by Fit Finley then the Belfast Bruiser and they just go all out. I mean, holy shit. Yeah, I think around this time, too, they might have had one on Nitro, like a parking lot match. Right? Yeah, they, they had a couple of matches, and I want to say this was their first, but I'm not definitely not 100% on that, but they had a few just super stiff matches that were like, whoa, this is... <laughs> I don't think I'm watching just, you know, choreographed, worked wrestling here. This is just a fight. <laughs> What the fuck was up with Fit Finley there? He had like the mustache <laughs> and like the Tupelo mullet, and then didn't he have like <laughs> the Tupelo mullet? <laughs> and then he he had like the Road Warrior, you know, jacket, like the Mel Gibson Road Warrior jacket thing. It was weird. <laughs> the Tupelo mullet. Uh, yeah, he did. It was like he he like started going gray, so it was kind of even a worse mullet than. I guess your your average two dollar ball. <laughs> you got this these long locks of gray hair that's in a mullet, and yeah, the the um, half shoulder pad thing going on from the from the road warrior. So very good stuff there. Worst match. What do you think? I kind of didn't really like the street fight. You know, they had the Regal and Finley match that was a legit like street fight. But then the actual street fight for the um, like with the tag match, I don't know. I wasn't really feeling it that well. Right, I was definitely getting like visions of Sting and Hawk versus the Nasty Boys from Starcade '93, uh, which went an ungodly thirty minutes. Uh, and this this match that that you mentioned, which is Sting and Booker versus uh, the Road Warriors. And, I mean, I went in ex- totally expecting to hate it, uh, when, especially when I, I looked at the, the length and saw how far that bar had to progress on the network <laughs> to get to the finish. And I'm just like, oh, God, what am I in for? And I, I don't know. I kind of found myself surprisingly liking it. I don't know why they, they booked this thing to go 30 minutes, but I thought they did a pretty capable job of of keeping it lively but having said that i i think i would concede yeah this would be the match i'm lowest on as well just because it it should not have been that long they and yes they did the best they could with it but why saddle them with this kind of burden it's just i did like the bit where they go backstage and uh interrupt luger during his kind of pre-match ceremony he's posing in front of the mirror <laughs> i guess i i do give it props for that but um yeah i i i mean there's other just kind of shit on this card with you know you had the the giant and Loch Ness, but that's totally inoffensive and then even like medusa and like colonel parker that one's like so short but i was actually mm-hmm. on the opposite end i was kind of getting into it and then mm-hmm. boom, it just ended but there again, it's it's less than five minutes. So what are you going to get worked up about? Yeah. So, yeah, like it's better than Michael Cole and like Jerry Lawler. Oh you know? my God! <laughs> or Bret Hart and Vince McMahon. Oof! It's it's hard to find a lot of fault with the stuff here on on ninety six. It's just um, too competent for its own good. Outside of just that hot mess of the main event. But in any case, that's nineteen ninety six. Uncensored 1997, 
We have now left the Tupelo Coliseum. We are from the North Charleston Coliseum, and pretty big show for the promotion. And, you know, stop us if you've heard it, but it's a 1997 WCW pay-per-view. We're pretty high on it. What do you think? Yeah, I'm definitely high on this pay-per-view. I don't know how familiar you are with it, but this is one, like I've talked about all the tape trading and stuff when we really got into it with uh, the episode with Andrew uh, Reich, uh where I was sending him stuff. But this is one I think I got back in that era. But I've had this show for a while, for like 10 years now, and it's one that I go to pretty regularly to watch because everything on there is really good. So- yeah, from top to bottom, this this is a super solid show. The opener is Eddie Guerrero versus Dean Malenko. And it's weird because I was expecting a lot from this match, and I felt it was just kind of so-so. It sort of put me in kind of a down mood for the rest of the show, but it picks back up in a big way. Like, on any other night, you would expect that to, to be your best match. And here, I, I, I felt like it wasn't. It just sort of started getting better better from that point, even though maybe I came in with, with too high of expectations. I don't know. It's similar to 96 in that you have a very stacked main event. It's it's top-heavy where you've got just a lot of, of your main event guys in the actual main event. So they're leaning pretty heavily on their undercard uh, but they had such just a a deep vent, a deep bench here in '97 of super over and and good workers that they could pull it off um, in a way that they couldn't in in perhaps years past. Ultimo Dragon versus Psychosis was a match that I've seen probably uh, on a lot of different shows. These guys sort of paired off a lot, but here, I mean, they really tore the house down, I thought, um, and, and got a, more of a showcase than they probably would on other shows where they might be buried or overshadowed by, by bigger stuff going on around them. Uh, so th- that's an example of, of how I think this show really shines in that they they did have such a showcase for just their, their kind of mid-card type guys and, you know, the cruiserweights and the loser doors that, that we've praised so much. Everybody can say, hey, like they didn't put over uh, the vanilla midgets and yada yada, but those guys are actually wrestling not for the cruiserweight title in the opening match, but that was a U.S. title, right? Yeah, that was was U.S. title in that uh, that opener. Yeah, so it was kind of cool to give those guys like a match like that and have it be almost, I think that was like the longest match on the show too. Actually, so they gave it some time. It definitely got some time, you're right. And it's kind of cool in that Malenko is very much working the match as a heel, but Eddie had kind of started his heel turn too. So it's not quite, but almost a heel versus heel match, which you don't see a lot of. And, and especially, you know, in a pay-per-view opener like this with two guys that are pretty strong, established characters. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought it was, um, a, an interesting uh, role reversal in, in that sense from, from what you usually expect from them. There's also other shit going on where they would cut away from the match to, to show you backstage where fucking Rick Steiner got taken out or, or, you know, things of that nature. So maybe took away from it a little, took away from my enjoyment a little bit, but at the end of the day, it, it it's still Dean and Eddie. So even Glacier and Mortis, holy shit. <laughs> How how do they have such a good match? That's that that just kind of came out of nowhere for me. Yeah, really, because people dog on like Glacier over the years, but I don't know. That match was awesome too. I think there's like Scotty Riggs and like Buff Bagwell, so they're kind of blowing that off. The uh, American males explode, and it's a strap match because it's uncensored, so it has to involve a strap somehow. Buff does an interesting thing here where he always sort of did this, but. Maybe he was still trying to figure out his his new heel character a little bit and and experimenting with uh, with different gimmicks. He talks to the camera a lot in this match. I mean, like to an excessive degree that 
it was almost breaking the fourth wall. Like a, <laughs> I was like, what am I fucking watching Ferris Bueller here? What is... <laughs> and I mean, I don't even want to criticize that because it was a thing that nobody else was doing. I felt like, especially in this time period, it, was he ripping anybody off or was anybody else doing that kind of thing where they're trying to get themselves over within the course of the match, talking into the camera like that, that seemed pretty innovative to me. Wasn't there something where Jerry Lawler was almost doing the same thing when it was like, I know there was that one on raw way back in like 93 where he's up in the balcony. He's heckling Brett while he's wrestling Bam Bam. But I think he might've done it maybe to Jake Roberts or something, didn't he, where they were doing the drunken angle and I think he might have been talking to him. Um, but I think he's talking to him on a microphone. He's not talking to the camera. So, the, mm-hmm. um, yeah, you're right. This is a different thing altogether. I mean, he did do the thing in, what was it, Rumble 97, where he's on commentary. And then he's uh, an entrant in the Rumble, too. So he's kind of like, hold that thought on commentary, gets into the match, gets immediately knocked out gets right back on commentary and finishes his, his thought. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's definitely what I think of with him, but I could for sure see him as a dude who would, who would do that kind of thing. I don't know. Maybe I, I underestimated buff a little bit. It just seemed like maybe he was onto something there and a guy doing that today, I think would get over super huge. Even if it was just like a, like a dumb little underground cult following sort of thing that the company didn't recognize and, and seize on, uh, I, I think would go a lot further today than, than maybe it would in, in 97 where it, it just kind of didn't register. I don't know. There's one other thing that stands out to me about that match, but it's not really like Buff Bagwell or the match itself. What stands out the most is just a cheesy commentary line from Dusty, because that's all I'm about on this show. He's carrying him like a like a sack of wet semen. And it's like he's like trying to say cement, but with Dusty Rhodes' list, it's like wet semen. They kept going back to that because Dusty said it. That was like his, his sort of like go to analogy. And I don't know if, if maybe Bobby noticed it because <laughs> they just kept going back and forth and, and saying it over and over and over. And then Tony was like trying to keep it together and failing miserably as, as he often did trying to corral these two. And it was just like, wet semen, wet semen over. <laughs> it <was> just, <laughs> well, you know, wet semen doesn't kick back. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. No, that, I'm glad you pointed that out. That was um, enhanced the match tremendously for me as well. Uh, which was already more than you would expect from the the American males implosion. We have a, the main event has that sort of big match feel, but with teams like like a war games match. I don't think that was something they had ever done before or since, which uh, is a little bit surprising to me. I did feel that the stipulations telegraphed that. Team WCW was not winning this thing. I thought that was kind of phony, the the way that they were building up the stakes here, because one was so much in disproportion to the others. But it's a solid enough match, I I, I guess. Um, I was kind of looking at it the same way. I was like, God, these stipulations are, like, awful. And then it was kind of dumb where it's like, It's got Royal Rumble rules, and people enter at different intervals. All three guys would enter at the same time, so it was kind of like really like sped up. You know, you had three guys, and then boom, 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 or something. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, three and three and just it it they kept up that that team format. So yeah, so I thought it was hybrid. Um, yeah, so I thought it might have like worked better as an actual Royal Rumble. Like um, you know, start with two guys. And then continue with one guy after that. But I thought the match, just looking at the match itself from like bell to bell, like I thought it was entertaining. It was like, it was hot and it got you into it. I thought it was the same scenario with like Lex Luger, like throughout this period in like 96 and 97, where it seemed really like one sided on the surface, where okay, you got Lex Luger against all four bad guys. But then he like racks them, and you got the crowd getting into it. So it kind of like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
uh, because that was kind of entertaining and the crowd was getting into it, it kind of erased like smart kind of uh, views, um, you know, that we were just talking about. It kind of erased all that because I was getting into it and I'm like, like, sweet, Luger's doing the rack and boom, he's got that guy out, he's got the other guy out and then... Yeah, I, setting aside just the match up to that point, the finish was so super hot. He just starts fucking him up. And this, of course, was the, the introduction to the worm, Dennis Rodman, who was such a great contribution to, uh, to WCW and, and the NWO at this time, um, making his presence felt and being responsible for, for Luger's defeat here. Um, but that was just super crazy hot. And it was cool because Lex Luger, he, he felt like he was a... Um, I don't know how to phrase it, a, a collateral beneficiary of Sting's absence, you know, where they needed somebody to just keep the the keep the dream alive week to week, so to speak, where you, you need that, that glimmer of hope. And Sting wasn't always going to be there. He's not actively wrestling, and he's only a special attraction, um, but... Luger is, is really carrying the burden here and, and having to to work matches and be sort of that guy in, in Sting's absence and reaping the benefits for it. Uh, and I, they used him to, to great effect. I, I have very mixed feelings on Lex Luger just as a worker, and he's just so hit and miss. But when utilized properly, like, like he was here, um, it's great. It's it's really tremendous. And that leads right into the Sting entrance from the rafters. And the place just came unglued at that point. Because this was Sting firing like that first big shot against the NWO. And holy shit. Although I thought, shit, man, Sting's a shitty friend. He's like 20 minutes late. <laughs> he comes in after the match, like even after it's like the shenanigans are all over. Then he finally comes down. Just the event itself, when he comes down and that sort of slight hesitation when it's just like him and Hall facing off in the ring and he just wears him out with the bat and then everybody gets in there and he's just whipping all their asses. It just sort of became the, the template for Sting as, as the superhero mega over savior of the company boy how did they fuck that up <laughs> yeah like i have to agree with uh, you there too i don't know i was never like a luger guy but now thanks to this show it's like going back and watching all this stuff i'm like man he was really awesome in like 96 and 97 it was like mm -hmm. he was the man in those years like we were saying on the like, 96 one too yeah he was really entertaining then in a different way no doubt yeah but now i i can really appreciate it more I think um, I think I go Dragon versus Psychosis as as my favorite. Um, just as many times as they had fought before, it's, it's still always a treat, and they go all out here. Psychosis totally fucks up Ultimo Dragon with that that guillotine leg drop, which always looks pretty brutal. But heel goes right across his face and. I guess it's kind of good that, that Ultimo Dragon was wearing a mask there because I feel like that would have really messed him up bad. It, it just looked rough. Um, there's also Dusty Rhodes' favorite match of all time on this card <laughs> with uh, Harlem Heat versus, versus the Public Enemy in a Texas Tornado match. Talk about commentary, being able to, to make a match better than, than it is on the surface. Um, it is just a, a joy to behold this with, with dusty commentary. <laughs> what did you think of that? Oh man. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. Like, I think we mentioned it before, but like the commode lid and like laying his tired ass out. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite call of all time. Oh boy, he laid it. Look at him. Oh boy, he laid his old tired ass out. Look at him. <laughs> Just uh, his love of that match kind of makes me love the match. And then you, he's laughing too, so it gets you into it even more because it's like he's just mm -hmm. losing his shit. 
He's he's having to apologize because he even knows he's he's coming apart so badly <laughs> on air. And Tony just can't say anything. <laughs> he probably just muted his microphone. <laughs> uh and uh it's just you look back on pretty much any WCW pay-per-view from 1995 through 97 there is always some combination of a tag match with either Harlem Heat, Nasty Boys, Public Enemy, or I guess the Steiners. Maybe throw in Faces of Fear. I don't know. And they sort of just wash over you. They're, it's kind of like, okay, here we go. Here's the tag match with Harlem Heat and whoever. Um, but this one uh, definitely is a standout. <laughs> it... uh. It's a uh, gosh. I see now. I'm starting to reevaluate my my decisions here, and, and thinking maybe that's my favorite, just because Dusty was so enthusiastic about it, and it made me so much more enthusiastic about it. We'll set that aside for now. What what do you have as, as your lowest match on this card? Rey Mysterio and Prince IKEA 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 Prince IKEA. That should be my worst match, but I actually sort of dug it. I know that everybody really seems to hate Prince Iakea and just thought he was trash, but he seemed fine here. He's definitely not on Mysterio's level, but could almost work up to it. And yeah, Ray is carrying the match, but I thought it came off pretty decently so that one surprised me um see yeah it's the same way it's just everything to me is so like strong that it's not bad but it's just okay That's um, everything else is so good that i like so well and that one's not bad it's just kind of like well it's not uh ultimo dragon or um it's yeah. not the uh um tag team match we just talked about I hate to say it, but I almost feel like Dean and Eddie is my quote-unquote worst match on this. Again, victim of expectations. You want so much more from that. And they didn't give me what I wanted. But it just it feels sacrilegious almost saying that. So, God, there's just I mean, there's nothing bad on this show. It's, it's I, hello, 1997 awesome solid wcw pay-per-view outing just shit can't go wrong yeah and talking about 1997 being good and how we just like sung the praises of luger i'm really looking forward to uh the bash at the beach uh with luger and the giant who we've also been high on the giant on this show and then Mm -hmm. um rodman and hogan and i'm really wanting to watch it but i'm holding off purposely on watching it because i know there's some of these things that I want to see again um, in this context. I'm waiting until we get to it. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of similar in that regard. And watching this made me want to see that match more. And I I almost fired it up right right after I had finished the show. And I yeah, was I like, thought no. about that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're kind of a uh, we're kind of in sync there, and and wanting to save it for the show, as as I say. <laughs> So uh, it w- maybe that's a stay tuned, right? We'll we'll get to it, no doubt, down the line. All right. Well, we are halfway through our survey of the WCW Uncensored. I think this is a pretty good opportunity to take a break, ha- have a have a pee, have a Dr Pepper or a Dr Slice. Oh, Dr. Dr. Thund- Slice. Dr. Slice, Dr. Thunder, Dr. Harvey Schiller. <laughs> Dr. Becker. <laughs> Dr. Becker, doc- Dr. Shasta. That's a good one. Yeah. Have yourself a, a Dr. Whatever knockoff and get some relief. We will be right back for the second half of our Uncensored Survey.
promotional consideration paid for by the following. Hey, pro wrestling announcer Kevin Kelly here. I want to make sure you are all subscribed to all the great feeds here at Place to Be Nation. It's really easy to do. Just head to iTunes or your preferred podcatcher app today and search and subscribe to the Place to Be Nation wrestling feed, which, of course, includes the full archives of The Kevin Kelly Show, the Place to Be Nation pod feed, and the Pro Wrestling Only feed. Subscribe, listen, and then rate us and leave feedback today. And be sure to give Justin your true thoughts. I mean, don't hold back. After all, he is kind of a jerk. Just listen to Scott. Place Simulations, JT Rosero and Chad Campbell here. We want to let you know that we have a ton of great podcasts available to you on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and PlaySimulation.com. And we offer those to you on three great feeds. On the Place to Be Nation wrestling feed, we bring you the Mothership, the original Place to Be podcast, as well as main event to Lucha Afterground and our monthly pay-per-view reaction shows, as well as the Our Vantage Point podcast and Jeff Learns Wrestling. In addition to these full-length shows, we also deliver quick-hit pod blasts on topics old and new. Over on the Pro Wrestling Only feed, we dive deep inside the wrestling business with a stacked army of experts leading the way. The feed features potpourri shows such as This Week in Wrestling, Greetings from Allentown, Psychology is Dead, Puro Puri, Stacy and Elliot's Bogus Journey, and the Military Industrial Suplex. We also have shows that focus intently on certain topics like Letters from Center Stage, Space City, and NWA Classics On Demand Adventure, Through the Years, Strong Style History, Strong Style Story, and Mount Olympus. Plus, the feed has the full archives of legendary shows like Titans of Wrestling, Where the Big Boys Play, Letters from Kayfabe, and much more. And on our popular Place to Be Nation Pop podcast feed, we offer such great shows as the Glenn Butler Podcast Hour Spectacular, Rank and File, PTBN Dadcast, Go Home in a Box, NBA Team, and Lucha Undead, as well as a vertical podcast heaven for comics fans with the hard-traveling fanboys, Sellers Points, Todd Weber's Conversation, Geek and Sassy, and Imaginary Stories Podcasts. You can find all of these current shows plus archives of our past podcasts, including The Kevin Kelly Show, as well by subscribing to all of our feeds on iTunes. And while there, be sure to rate and leave feedback as well. All of these shows plus others available on PlaySimulation.com, where we cover pro wrestling, sports, movies, comics, plus in-depth stretch projects and more. Be sure to support our site by using PlaySimulation.com backslash Amazon when shopping online and download our free PTB Vintage Vault Refresh eBooks via the links on our site. We also want to thank our friends at Bonehead's Wing Bar in West Rock, Rhode Island and Fall River, Massachusetts, TheHistoryWrestling.com, and Scott Keats' Blog of Doom. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr as well. PlaySimulation.com, the only place to be in your pop culture world. Place to be Nation Wrestling, welcome back to WCW Survey Says for the second half of our uncensored survey. So you heard about the great variety of podcasts that we offer across two great feeds, the Place to be Nation Wrestling feed and the Place to be Nation Pop feed. Uh, I've been somewhat busy in that regard and have appeared on a couple of shows that that may be of interest to you uh, depending on what you're into and what the cut of your jib is uh, have started a new brand new podcast venture on place to be nation pop it is called talking pop myself and the great the wonderful always entertaining and very funny jennifer smith also known as jenny smith we had our debut episode in February, had a lot of fun with our special guest and the sort of godfather, Grand Poobah, 
And the Svengali Supreme of Place to Be, that is the one and only JT Rosero, who we've also had on Survey Says. Again, myself and Jenny Smith, if I can uh, toot my own horn there. Toot toot. Also recently, again on Place to Be Nation Pop, Go Home in a Box with Chris and Joel. Joined them earlier this year to take a look at uh, two, I guess I can call them gems in the early outing of uh, what was not yet the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but Marvel Properties in the 1990 Captain America, starring the one and only Matt Salinger, I guess, and then The Punisher, from 1989 with Dolph Lundgren. In some ways, maybe the best cinematic translation of The Punisher. I don't know. You be the judge. Check out the show. That is Go Home in a Box. A lot of fun. Uh, a little bit different. But check that out if, if you're a fan of sort of cult classic movies. Uh, definitely had a blast uh, sitting down with uh, Chris and Joel for that. Uh, what else have we got going on? I do have uh, sort of the, I guess now quarterly, so to speak, uh, podcast with Todd Weber. That is Conversation Comics. We've been looking at the John Byrne and Chris Claremont run on Uncanny X-Men. That's a slew of issues we've been running down. So not quite done yet, but we are... I would say more than halfway through that. So check out Conversation Comics. That is the manager, Todd Weber's show on Place to Be Nation Pop on a semi-regular, mostly quarterly basis. So that's what I've been up to uh, in terms of the the particulars of these shows that uh, that I would just like to put over while I while I have the floor here on Survey Says. Uh, anything you'd like to add to that, Andy? Well, I listened to both of your shows, the Captain America one on Go Home in a Box, and then um, now your brand new show on the Pop Feed. And I like both of them, but now it kind of puts it in more of a context because we were talking about Harlem Heat and Nasty Boys and Sherry like slipping and sliding at the concession <laughs> stand. And I think on that show with JT and um, Jen, you were talking about people like slipping, and so it kind of puts it in more context now. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, JT had a great falling story <laughs> on, a, on that debut episode. So uh, if you're a fan of those things like I am, do please check that out. It's uh, definitely worth the download. My goodness. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to crack up just, just thinking about that again. <laughs> I, you know, I had one of those stories as well. I, I busted my ass in the parking lot at work. So, um, yeah, <laughs> good times as always. These, of course, all on Place to Be Nation Pop. I will say that uh, although I am now dividing my time on a regular basis between Survey Says and Place to Be Nation Pop, you'll, you'll find no decline in quality, even though I am now a regular on Talkin' Pop. Uh, our new show, but um, everyone talks about how they, you know, they they just don't have enough time. I don't, I don't have enough time to to fit this into to my life. This whatever this thing that that I'm interested in that I want to do, I, I just don't have time for it. Well, nobody has time for anything. Nobody, we we all have limited time. We we have to make time for these things. We have to we have to make room, push other things off to the side. And, and I'd like to think that, uh, that the, the way that I have, that I'm fitting in these, these additional podcasts with, again, hopefully no decline in, in quality is the things that I am cutting out of my life are, you know, like productivity at my job, my, my actual job responsibilities. We can, we can cut that right out. Um, that things like, uh, exercise, going to the gym, don't need that anymore. Just just dispense with it. Um, healthy eating, just get rid of that. Sleep, don't need it. You know, it's all about the podcast. Yeah, because you've got like uh, six uncensored shows you had to watch, so I kind of put you through that again. 
picking all the shows and going, hey, do it. Watch all these shows. Do it. Yep. Just do it. Get it done. That is exactly right. And it it's... was a labor of love for me. I hope it was for you, too. Uh, because what we are talking is WCW Uncensored. And our next outing is Uncensored 1998. And that was on March 15th from the Mobile Civic Center in Mobile, Alabama. This is one that's, um, I guess, a little bit more familiar to me since I was definitely more locked into the product, once again, by 1998. Not that I saw this as it aired at the time, but, you know, I wasn't that far removed from it when I did see this show. Pretty good time capsule with what's presented here, as uncensored as a whole kind of is. In any case, uh, pretty stacked solid card where things just sort of build from the bottom right up to the top uh there's not you know there's not like that bathroom break type match that you expect on a lot of contemporary pay-per-views it just sort of builds and builds and builds upon itself until your uh your main event which uh the main event of this show was age in the cage uh three or Four, depending on your reckoning we should do an entire episode devoted to all of the age in the cage matches what do you think andy yeah like hey okay, we've already watched <laughs> enough hogan savage cage matches we might as well watch the hogan uh, piper one too that's right yeah becoming kind of a recurring theme i guess these these hogan main events and hogan cage matches and middle-aged main eventers because this is Hollywood Hogan with Macho Man Randy Savage in the implosion of not the Mega Powers, but the NWO. Both of them stalwart NWO members colliding in the cage match here. That's the one that I got to say is like <laughs> people shit. People shit on the one uh, that we just talked about from 96. But this one is... It's like terrible. It's like remember the Hogan Hogan beating on Sting when he couldn't even get his coat off, you know, at Super Brawl yeah. and he's just like whipping him around. It was the same way like Macho Man, I don't think he had really any offense until they got outside of the cage or something. Hogan's just like totally annihilating the Macho Man. I don't know, Brutus Beefcake comes out with gimmick number like 5 or 6 or something. <laughs> he's like the yes. disciple and I had almost the totally disciple. Forgot. I'd almost forgotten about the disciple. He comes in there, then um, Sting like drops down, and this is during the point where I think Sting, it was like people were dressing up as uh, Sting and doing the fake outs, and I think mm. even that one that we're talking about, or we just mentioned, Hogan and Piper in the cage, they had like fake Stings in that one, and I yeah. thought when Sting dropped down, it was going to be another fake one, and it was really him, so I was kind of like a thrown off, and that kind of got me interested in the match a little bit. It was the only thing interesting right. to me about the match was um, Sting coming down. And I'm like, well, is that really Sting? What's going to happen? So I was kind of invested in the post-match part more than the actual match. It's just, it's kind of weird all around. It's one of those, it, it doesn't feel like a proper pay-per-view main event in its own right. It's just all sort of storyline advancement, which was uh, kind of the order of the day. By, by 98, where WCW, they don't care that much about uh, the, their live event promotions. They don't care that much about pay-per-view. It's all about driving the, the television ratings, right? So that's that's what this is about, just getting you to tune into Nitro the next night, which I'm sure this was very effective in, in doing so. But, I mean, you're right that the match itself is, is garbage and... I mean, you even said, while they are outside the cage, that's that's when the disciple interferes. Well, why are they outside the cage in a cage match? <laughs> they, you know, they just they just leave the cage. It's it's fine. It's whatever. This is um, I think I'm on record as sort of hating escape rules anyway in cage matches. But you do you do sort of think that um, they get out get out of the cage the match is over well no nope, not here it's just totally incidental to this match and um that's just 
to, to say the least of this main event's offenses, you sort of have to grade Hogan matches on a curve anyway by by this point in time. They're not going to be stiff. They're not going to be hard-hitting. They're, they're not going to be believable at all, but they can still be entertaining. See Hogan versus Piper at, at Starcade 96 for, like, Exhibit A in that. You know, not a great, well-worked match at all, but still pretty fun. And this is not that. It's it's not at all. It's It's a bad match with a worse finish, and... I think, would I be correct in saying this is both of our worst match on the show <laughs> honors going to this one? Yeah, because at least, like, uh, the cop-out finish at 95 made sense. Everything that happened before the finish was entertaining, you know, with the Renegade, Flair, Vader, and, like, Jimmy Hart and stuff. It was entertaining, but this one, you could excuse uh, the crap finish if the match was good, but the match wasn't good either, so that's why, mm-hmm. like, I don't like it. Yeah, yeah, nothing to nothing to see there, really. Oof. What a dog! Uh, this show does have the Chris Jericho Dean Malenko match for the cruiserweight championship, where Dino Machino loses in this pretty high profile match. Big win for Jericho as he's really on his way up uh, and settling into that that groove in his heel character. And you've got the the, uh, the great post match interview with with Mean Gene, where he's just he's berating Malenko and telling him, uh, "You blew it, you blew it, Malenko," and that of course pops me every time I see it. Um, and asks Dean what what he's going to do next, where is he going from here, and, and Dean simply responds, "Home." And that got Dean more over than pretty much he'd ever been in his career, really in absentia for about a month or so, where you know Jericho is still cutting promos on him and playing up the fact that, that he lost and couldn't cut it and talking shit about his dad, all this stuff. And who knew that could get somebody so over, but still feel so very old school. So um, I don't know that a really good angle, but, did you think much of that as a match? Because I was sort of like, eh, it's it was okay for these two. Yeah, I liked it, but I think that happened later on, like in the summer. So I, I guess I was kind of used to it because I think like later on when they had matches again, like a Bash at the Beach or something, mm-hmm. uh, they were more about the angle than the match itself. But the angle's good, so it's like, like I'm saying, like what I was saying about the Hogan stuff. As long as like one part was good, you can kind of forgive the other half. Yeah, yeah, it was sort of the inverse of that. You're right. No doubt. Now, I had, as my match of the night, and I, I think we're in lockstep here, the triangle slash triple threat match of one Chris Benoit. <laughs> <laughs> Continuing his feud with uh, Raven. <laughs> in the flock versus diamond Dallas page, the United States heavyweight champion at the time. So, uh, this was again, a triple threat match. Had they really done triple threats as we know them today up to this point? Hadn't really researched that. See, they had done like, I think we've watched a couple before, like triangle matches where Mm -hmm. they had, like all three at once, or I think they might have done the triangle where it was what Flair and Sting and Luger at that um, Starcade '95, but mm-hmm. Flair was on the outside. And I think we even pointed that out, and Tony was saying it too. Like, who's ever on the outside has the advantage, while the other two guys are fighting. But I think this is one of the first times where three guys wrestling at the same time, and it was like really worked this way in the way that we know, like a triple threat match. Yeah. Because uh, I think uh, the Super Brawl, um, 97, had a triple threat. That was the Australian Rules tag team match. But this is, yeah, the first triple threat mm-hmm. uh, with three guys. Yeah, where they're they're not, uh, and they're not in teams. It's it's just three guys in the ring at the same time doing their thing. And in a 
uh, and sort of that brawl type of uh, environment that you sort of expect from triple threats as well. Thinking about it, it's kind of the style that WWF used for all their attitude brawls, which would kind of come up a month after this or so, where they fight all over the ringside and kind of go off to the set and break stuff. It's like WWF would really go for that as their kind of like main event style with Austin, but they're actually doing it like maybe a month ahead here. Right. Yeah. And, and they did sort of beat the WWF to the punch in, in that sense. I want to, I'm wondering if, if ECW did any of these tight triple threats up to this point, I feel like they probably did, but I just don't know my, my ECW history very well. So this is maybe kind of pioneering. There's that great bit where they where Benoit and Raven throw DDP into the monitors, and he he uh, it's like a light bright kind of thing, I guess, where it's still flashing while he's uh, on the ground, and the, the the shit is you know wrapped around his head, and that takes him out of the match for a stretch, and Benoit and Raven are going at it, uh, having their usual good singles match until DDP gets back involved. The finish was sort of a little bit weird, but also kind of worked with uh, DDP hitting the the diamond cutter off the turnbuckles on Raven. I think they were supposed to go through the table, but table didn't break. (laughs) And so it just sort of toppled over. But it looks still sort of cool. So, I don't know, it, it, it worked for me, and just helped uh, put DDP over that much more, where he's like this fighting champion, and having these these successful title defense, defenses with his then still pretty fresh, newly won U.S. championship. That was a, a lot of fun, and, and really held down kind of the upper mid-card of this, this show. Yeah, this was really, um, too, this whole show is in the uh, sweet spot we're talking about. And we mentioned before on other shows where we really like Spring of 98, and this is kind of nearing the peak. Absolutely. There was Nash and the Giant in a rematch from Sold Out, right, where um, Giant almost has his neck broken, the powerbomb. Um, this didn't really live up to that, but sort of a cool showing for the Giant where he he gets to take out some of the NWO job guys, but Nash like breaks the bat over his back and leads to more stuff down the line. Again, sort of that just continuation rather than settling anything here with these big matches. You know, otherwise, I, I don't have a lot to say on this. It's just kind of a good, solid, middle-of-the-road type 1998 pay-per-view outing. Uh, there were they certainly had better, um, but they had a lot worse too <laughs> to offer in this year. It's definitely not like a desert island pay per view, but if you're just bored and want something to watch that you probably haven't seen in a while or maybe haven't seen at all, throw it on. Check it out. From this show, like uh, we talked about the triple threat that we really liked. I also liked the opener too, Booker T and Eddie Guerrero, and I think even Bobby Heenan. He liked it too because I don't remember exactly what he said during the match on commentary, but he was really putting over Eddie Guerrero when he's like, I was basically saying that he's the next guy, the star to watch or something, Mm. and he's going to break out. And I think that was when he was doing the thing where Chavo was at ringside kind of like in his corner um, reluctantly. So it it had kind of a good story going. Yeah, Chavo was... uh newly into uh, Eddie's servitude because uh, uh, he challenged Eddie to a match on Thunder on the condition that if he lost, he would basically do whatever Uncle Eddie said, and he did proceed to lose that match. So if you think nothing happened on on Thunder, think again, because this uh, early outings of of that program was was something to – to reflect on quite positively. And so you have Chavo at ringside. He's, he's not become unhinged yet as he would uh, later on in the year. And it's, it's funny because he, he has to put up a front here of, of supporting Eddie, but he sort of 
smirking and, and laughing to himself as uh, Eddie proceeds to lose the match. Booker T, then television champion, successful title defense, and you know that just begins this this saga of of Eddie and Chavo that would play out um, pretty amusingly for the better part of, of 1998. So yeah, forgot about that. Even a guy that I like to dog on, a uh, K Dog, I think he kind of had an all right match too, wasn't it? Against Hooventude. That's right. He did have that that match with Hoovy. Sort of, he was a little bit limited at this point, I think, in, in terms of what he could actually do in the ring, but you could tell he was trying more, probably because he was working with a, one of his guys, a guy that, that he really liked and respected. So while it isn't, um, doesn't set the world on fire, it's still um, more than, than you would think of a, a Conan match being in the late 90s. So yeah, that that was um, that was a little bit surprising to me too. Moving on, a year later we have uncensored 1999. Now this was from the Freedom Hall in Louisville, Kentucky, on March 14th. These shows were always mid March. I noticed they they really had that locked down. It seemed like uh, what we haven't talked about. You know, this was the <laughs> WCW pay-per-view opposite WrestleMania. So I don't know what kind of counter-programming it might have offered uh, in most years against WrestleMania, but nevertheless, it was uh, it was WCW's March pay-per-view, their, their third pay-per-view of the year. So that's uh, it, it wasn't their version of WrestleMania, but that was what it was kind of competing against on on the other side. But we can talk more on that as yeah. we progress here. Yeah, I think we've kind of mentioned it before. Maybe it came up on the Super Brawl one and how we were saying. I think, like, maybe I said it, but this kind of feels like the apology show for Super Brawl 9 because, like, they do mm. have some of the rematches and some different people go over who, like, didn't go over at Super Brawl. And um, I actually kind of like the show. And I think it does maybe age a little bit better than WrestleMania uh, 15, like at least for me, for a comparison's sake. Like I know I've watched this like more times than I have watched WrestleMania 15. Ooh, yeah, that was uh, Russo Mania, WrestleMania, wasn't it? Now yeah. that I think back on it, you're right. And I, I think it was Travis who pointed out uh, Super Brawl a month before this was, I want to say, the last WCW show that made money. And this, as you mentioned, felt like a response and an, an apology for some of the booking from Super Brawl because that show was very poorly received. I mean, although it, it did make money, it just um, was heavily criticized. And for good reason, I felt like. And this has a lot of rematches from that show where they just kind of do the opposite or, or very similar type matches, but with either, either a better finish or just a better match all around. Um, yeah. And I also but, kind of feel like too, they kind of brought this one back maybe to being the gimmick pay-per-view that it was in 95 and 96 with a lot of the stipulation matches and 99 kind of brought it back to that, I think too. So maybe that's kind of why I enjoyed it more because there was more of the gimmick matches because you had, instead of a strap match, you had the dog collar match where the guys were connected, and then you had the main event like cage match, another pff, another Hogan cage match, but still another <laughs> gimmick match, and they had like uh, the whips match. So I guess they didn't have the strap match, but they had the leather straps and the lumberjack match. So they still got to get a strap in somewhere. Uncensored is always the strap match pay per view. It seems like. Yeah, you're right. That is a recurring theme. The, not only the strap matches, but the, the Age in a Cage uh, main events. This having a Age in the Cage 4 or 5, <laughs> depending on your perspective here again. And uh, it's, you know, once more, stop you stop us if you've heard it. It's Hogan and Flair in the cage. Uh, it's a rematch from Super Brawl. This, a first blood cage match where um both guys actually 
blade, and it um, it does not stop the match. Uh, but that sort of plays into the finish where they do this really. Although Flair does go over, which a lot of people wanted to see uh, at Super Brawl a month before, um, they do this like stupid double turn thing where Hogan works the entire match as a face. And Flair wins through some shenanigans. Like, he bled first, but referee Little Nate Charles Robinson is is sort of in his pocket. Just a lot of bullshit in this match. It's not even good on the opposite end of the spectrum. I had, as my favorite match from this show, Mikey Whipwreck in his debut against cruiserweight champion Kidman. I had not seen a lot of Mikey Whipwreck, and well, I mean, still to this day, still haven't seen a lot of Mikey Whipwreck, but he impressed me a lot at this point, to the point that uh, I wondered if, like, was he this good in, in ECW, or does he just have his working boots on, trying to uh, make a splash in, in his debut with uh, the big national promotion? I don't know, but... Uh, I thought their match really knocked the dick off. Yeah, I'm actually familiar a little bit with ECW, uh, Mikey Whipwreck. Uh, Because in 2000, ECW was probably my number two, and WCW was the uh, number three. Even Mm -hmm. though to some people who are the hardcore ECW guys, that's like well past its prime, because really it was. It was dying then anyways in 2000. But I was really into it, especially the back half of... um, uh, 2000, because Mikey Whipwreck was teaming up with Tajiri, who uh, really sold me on ECW anyways, was seeing Tajiri. I'm like, holy shit, this guy's awesome. In the same way uh, mm-hmm. that Ultimo Dragon hooked me with WCW a couple years before, I really liked Tajiri and Whipwreck. They teamed up, and they were with uh, the Sinister Minister, the guy that was with Abyss for a while, uh, the James oh, yeah. Mitchell. Well, they had like a tag team kind of thing. Uh, like Unholy Alliance, or I don't even remember what kind of name they gave it. Those guys were wrestling the FBI, and it was uh, uh, the one guy that was with the Mamelukes, uh, the Tony Maritato guy. He was with... <laughs> it's Tony Marinara. <laughs> or Tony Marinara. Or some, I forget his name, but uh, yeah. uh, he was with the Mamelukes, but then like in uh, 2000, he was teaming with Little Guido as part of the FBI, and they had some really good, like, I haven't really went back and watched those in a while, but in the year 2000, in the year 2000, <laughs> um, I'll edit that out. But uh, um, No, you don't have to. I just wanted to say it because I like that. I really loved, like, I guess those matches knocked the dick off me. But, yeah, so I would say that Mikey Whipwreck probably was ECW's version of Kidman. Or, actually, Kidman was WCW's version of Mikey Whipwreck. Because I think Mikey Whipwreck was around in like 95 and 96, and he had some upset wins over Austin when Austin was there with the long blonde hair in 95. I think mm-hmm. Mikey Whipwreck might have beat him then in an upset, and then Mikey Whipwreck actually, I think he beat Cactus Jack in his last match. And it was like a loser leaves town thing. Everybody knew Cactus Jack, I think, was leaving because they were all smart and into it, and he was doing the gimmick of going to WWF, I think, anyways. But he ended up leaving and I think, yeah, so Mikey Whipwreck was kind of the upset guy, kind of like you can't powerbomb Kidman, and he'd always get the upset. So in a roundabout way, like I guess they were kind of, uh, here's these two guys that have the same gimmick, and now they're wrestling each other on the same uh, pay-per-view kind of thing. I never thought of it, thought of it that way, but, but I can definitely see that <clears throat> looking back. Um, makes a lot of sense. That's, that's pretty cool. It it is a shame that you didn't see more of Mikey Whipwreck in WCW. They dropped the ball on him after this. I, I really felt like where he he did not have any other high profile matches and completely fell by the wayside. and And that's too bad because it maybe some of that's on him. I I have no idea what was going on in his life <laughs> or if it's just WCW being WCW, but it just sucks either way. Well, I think I think uh, you could kind of tell he wasn't going to go anywhere. Sorry to laugh, but I think you can tell he wasn't going to go anywhere because Bobby Heenan was going to Mikey Shipwreck or Whip Dick or something. <laughs> he didn't get his name right. <laughs> Whip so Dick, it's, huh? 
<laughs> so, I, he was like totally like messing with his name, so it's almost kind of like a bad sign there. <laughs> and it, of course, he had the uh, Dungeons and Dragons um, ring attire that that Rob Van Dam also sort of pioneered. Um, that that might have held him back a little bit <laughs> in the eyes of management. What did you have as, as your best match? Was it that or, or anything else that, that caught your eye? That one was surprisingly good, and there was like a bump that I wanted to mention where I think they're on the outside, and Mikey goes to charge at Kidman, and Kidman moves out of the way, and Mikey flies over uh, the barricade onto the mm. floor and lands mm-hmm. on his back on the concrete. And it's kind of like Cactus Jack at some of those other shows where we've cringed. It's like, ooh, he landed on his back on the concrete. Ooh. Like, yeah, man, it hurts just to look at yeah. it. Makes your butt feel funny. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, they, I I know exactly. <laughs> it hurts you from your neck about. kiss to your butt kiss. <laughs> your butt kiss. This is that's right. <laughs> oh man. Um. Oh, but uh, no. Like my favorite match is the tag team match for the tag team titles. I guess here's the return match. Maybe the apology or something because yes, uh, they've the got the lumberjack re- apology match. <laughs> They've got the, uh, and they got to get the whips in there somehow. So it's like the lumberjack with whips, and it was for the tag team titles. But revisiting this now, like my favorite performers in the match uh, were the heels, Hennig and Wyndham. And they just completely like own the match because Hennig, he like, it seemed like he, like at the start of the match, it seemed like he forgot or he was doing his usual heel thing. Like he'd get hit, so he'd slide outside and like, you know, try to take a breather. Well, boom, here comes these guys with whips. And he's like, oh, shit, and, like, flips back in the ring. And then, like, he does it again. Like, he gets <laughs> decked, and he jumps out. And he does it a couple times. Well, then, throughout the progression of the match, then I think Wyndham and Hennig, like, start to take it to their advantage. And they would just, like, throw, like, Malenko out to the outside so he'd get whipped on. So they were, like, really owning it. And, like, in a way that Flair, like, owned being the lady and went all the way with the uh, the makeup. Owned being the lady. <laughs> <laughs> Very committed, no doubt. Or I guess that's a better way to say it. They were really committed to the gimmick, kind of like Flair was committed to being in drag. They were really committed to that, like, silly stipulation. And they made it work and made it entertaining. And, yeah, that match, like, it was good. No, you're right. That was a, that was a wang dang doodle of a match. It was, uh... Pretty solid as as apology matches go. <laughs> I don't disagree. And uh, it's a pre West Texas Rednecks uh, Henning and Wyndham here, so they would go on to greater things and and greater notoriety uh, later on in the year. Uh, little taste of that in their their team here. Um, what did you like the least in 1999? Well, the whole show was pretty uh, stacked. It was pretty good. Uh, what kind of didn't really pull its weight as much as the other sh- matches, the NWO B team explodes, I guess, <laughs> with uh, Stevie Ray and Vincent, or implodes, I guess. <laughs> it was just kind of all right. I, I am not inclined to disagree with you as, as that being the weakest match on this card. Um, it's it's not a winner. It's... it's uh. It's not something you need to go out of your way to see, certainly. I don't know. I think that kind of is the extent of, of what I had on, on 99. Was there anything uh, that you still got out there? Well, uh, we mentioned Saturn on the last show. We kind of had a Saturn love fest. We and did. And then uh, this one um, had Saturn and Jericho uh, with Ralphus on the outside. And it was kind of actually funny that Jericho didn't want to put the dog collar on and he wanted Ralphus <laughs> to do it. And Ralphus just kind of waves his finger at him and walks <laughs> away. Like, Ralphus, was he like mute or something? Because <laughs> I don't sure know if that, he ever talked. That's a good question. Uh, we we never heard him speak, but I don't know if they ever said that he couldn't. It's a distinct possibility. This is Jericho's last WCW pay per view. So. He goes out with the loss here in the dog collar match, but uh, Saturn is, of course, wearing the dress, which by this point he had come to prefer. So how about that? Uh, You know what? I actually looked up something. I was wondering what happened to Saturn, and I think what happened is like 04, 05. It was actually pretty cool um, because we were kind of singing his praises in the the ring, but it sounds like he was a good guy kind of out of the ring. 
Some lady was getting mugged, and he went to, like, help her or something, but he got hurt, or I think he actually mm-hmm. got shot and was trying yeah. to prevent the mugging. It sounds like he was kind of, like, doing something heroic, and he ended up taking a bullet. Yeah, I, I've heard that story, too. Um, he he definitely did get shot, uh, shot in the neck, I want to say. So that would have really meant the end of his in-ring career. Uh, he may have had other injuries, too, by that point. But, um, yeah, he, he seems to not be in tremendous physical shape today, but is still doing all right. Uh, I, I want to say maybe DDP reached out to him with the, the DDP yoga stuff where he's sort of rehabilitating these guys who are uh, falling by the wayside or, or sort of these, these lost souls in the, in the wrestling industry. Um, Man, kudos to DDP. He's really like a jam-up guy then. Right, he he definitely is. We um, that's another stay tuned. I, I think we'll uh, we'll put it at that. But anyway, that's uncensored. Nineteen ninety one, ninety nine, ninety one. Wow, what if they did an uncensored in ninety one? What would that look like? It would probably have like bears and and uh, monkeys. Oh man, <laughs> Big Josh, Big Josh wrestle, wrestling bears. Maybe. Yeah. And then I think they did in um, Halloween Havoc 91 had that cage with like a whole bunch of guys, Cactus Jack and the Diamond Stud, and then they had the electric chair in there. Oh, yeah, so, sure. So it would probably would have been like – it would have been like a shit show. Mm-hmm. Oh, but I think we would have been laughing at it. So, Gosh, it gosh. Now, now I'm in love with my, my fantasy um, booking of, of a hypothetical uncensored 1991. So. <laughs> In any case, unfortunately, what we're left with actually is Uncensored 2000, which hailed from the American Airlines Arena in Miami. So on March 19th, the last Uncensored. Oh, okay. So we've kind of talked about how this show is pretty much the same as Super Brawl 10, Super Brawl 2000. Um they're a little bit interchangeable in my mind. Uh, just, I remember the matches between those two shows, but I have a hard time placing which match landed where. You know what I mean? Yeah, because I think it's kind of like, uh, to me it feels like the opposite of Super Brawl um, 9 and Uncensored 91 <laughs> or 99. Because, <laughs> um, see, like I guess like I really liked... Super Brawl 2000, and then I didn't like Uncensored 2000 because it seemed like basically uh, the same show, but maybe it's because it was like I'd already seen it once before uh, because I think the main event still had Jarrett and Sid, and then you still had um, um you had Terry Funk on there. And you kind of had mm-hmm. the same kind of guys wrestling each other, I think, and just kind of like ran together. They kind of just played musical chairs with, with this card, right? where yeah. it is the same batch of guys in, in different arrangements. Uh, this is the uh, infamous and somewhat celebrated apple pie Indian strap match. <laughs> Guess the participants. It's Hogan and Flair once again. <laughs> so uh, we talked about how 1999 was not an example of a good Hogan and Flair match. Kind of run circles around this one, though. <laughs> Hogan seems more immobile than he usually is by this point in, uh, in 2000. He's not really doing anything. Flair's sort of not even trying uh, for Ric Flair. And it's not a fun match to watch. I, I didn't get a lot of even ironic enjoyment out of the the apple pie Indian strap match. How did you feel about it? Like the thing um, with Hogan here is he's back to being the red and yellow. And I think he kind of did the red and yellow, like in the summer of 99. Mm -hmm. And then here he's doing it. And to me, it seemed like it was really tired and old and out of place. Whereas like 
he did the whole red and yellow thing, and it got pops, and it was over like two years later in the WWF. But that's because he hadn't been there in the WWF in so long, and there was mm-hmm. some nostalgia um, attached to it. But him doing the red and yellow in 2000, it seemed out of place, and there was no nostalgia attached to it because he had just done it. Right. It didn't have the nostalgia attached to it, and it seemed, yeah, out of place because, like, um, on the other side of the card, um, you had Jarrett, who was a fresh main eventer, and then he gets kind of bumped down for Hogan and Flair again. So I kind of actually felt bad for Jarrett because he's, like, trying. And people have their feelings about Jarrett, like like mixed feelings and, you know, or maybe not even mixed, just bad feelings. <laughs> right. Well, that uh, Jarrett and Sid match was actually for the title, and you're right, they, they do play second fiddle to Hogan and Flair in, in this very nothing, no-stakes main event. Um, Jarrett and Sid is okay. Uh, Jarrett is doing his chosen one gimmick. Uh, but he's yet to really back it up because he keeps having like these title shots and not winning. He won't win his first uh, world championship until, I think, Stampede in, in April in WCW. So they're not really doing him any favors here, um, especially, you know, keeping the title on Sid. Like, what is what the hell is Sid really doing for you in your promotion? Like, it seems like with WCW, the money was always more in the chase with having a heel champion, even in like a chicken shit type heel champion, um, look at Hogan's run. And they're not doing that. Like, they're just keeping the belt on Sid for no, you know, real gain. So that was um, an unusual decision. Uh, of course, we have the. Uh, in, in keeping with the theme of uncensored, <laughs> we've got uh, Sting making oh, his making his return against the total package Lex Luger and a lumberjack arm cast match. <laughs> so, one of the things you'll you'll notice on Uncensored 2000 is like half the card, uh, half the guys have casts on their arm <laughs> and that's because the total package had uh pilmanized their arms he he'd been on the warpath just uh putting dudes arms in chairs and stomping on them breaking their arms left and right for uh for the better part of a month here so that's why you see all these dudes in arm casts i think even know. doug dillinger was out there too <laughs> <laughs> yes he's one of the lumberjacks Lex Luger broke his arm, and uh, he, he's looking for some payback here. And, uh, wow, talk about, again, the the commitment that you see here, commitment to the gimmick. Uh, all these guys in their, their cast, their lumberjacks. You had um, you had the guy, the faces who, who had been assaulted by Luger sort of backing up Sting and, and Luger with his own contingent of lumberjacks. Uh, the match is, um, uh, I, I want to say, neither here nor there. <laughs> um, especially being Sting's big return. He'd been out since Starcade, I think, uh, when uh, Luger took him out. So, at least it's, uh, at least it's a gimmick match like, like you want to see on an Uncensored, but it's just more of that sort of main event guys playing musical chair stuff. Uh, the month before it was Hogan and Luger. Here it's Sting and Luger. So, whatever. What did you like the most from this show, such as it was? Uh, it might blow your mind because it kind of blew my mind, but like the match I liked the most featured Brian Knobs. It was like <laughs> him wrestling three count. I loved yeah. it. It was like stupid shit, but it was it was it was funny and I enjoyed it. And I like the yeah. spot where all the three count guys are going off the ladder like diving on him. And it's just it was just a garbage match like WWF would do with Crash Holly and stuff at the time. It was fun and I enjoyed it and it was my favorite. I'm really disappointed we don't get the original three count music on the network. That's that's just a travesty and a disservice to those guys. Oh yeah, then there was that spot where like 
uh, where I guess Brian Nobbs had to pin each of the guys. And it was kind of funny how he pinned the first guy. And I think maybe the uh, timekeeper or the music person, they queued up the music because, like, they weren't uh, – like, they thought that was the end of the match. And they queued up the music. And then I think, like, Tony's like, oh, no, he's still got a pin – uh, he still got a pin like Shannon and Evan Courageous or something mm-hmm. after that. <laughs> and then it was kind of reversed where three count, they thought they had one, and they start singing or going to dance or something, and then Nobbs like, takes out the other guy and wins. So it was kind of just funny, like the little uh, screw-ups. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I could maybe go with that. I also did sort of find myself, uh, maybe in spite of myself, that is, enjoying a... Dustin versus Terry Funk in the in the bull rope match. Uh, I can Terry Funk is is barely <laughs> hanging on as a active wrestler by this time period. Uh, he's still though, you know, he, he's doing good stuff when when given the form and the opportunity. If he's not uh, doing moon salts off of horses, he's <laughs> he's <laughs> hanging Dustin Rhodes. Uh, Hanging him high outside the ring by a bull rope, so that <laughs> that that's always fun to to watch. So, and, and Dustin had that sort of career resurgence around this time, and I I want to say he had had he turned heel yet? No, nah, I think Funk was was the heel in this match. See, that's the thing. Like I just watched this two weeks ago. You would think I remember better than stuff that's older. <laughs> in this show but it just doesn't stick in my mind and and that's not because i wasn't watching wcw at the time it's just it's so kind of paint by numbers this this last uncensored as much of the year 2000 is yeah i think that's the problem with this uh maybe in uh 2000 that i've noticed is like they try to cram as many guys on the show um as possible like so it's uh, maybe mm-hmm. overcrowded with matches, and so you don't kind of remember them as well. And they're all like they all kind of run together because they're all quick, and they all kind of have a lot of uh, interference. But like the other uncensored, like I think the first one, ninety five, only had like seven matches, whereas this mm-hmm. one had like ten. So I guess maybe that's something to do with it too. Yeah, I noticed that it it did get kind of crazy with just the amount of guys that are shoved onto this card. Maybe trying to make up for some of their deficiencies the uh the radicals had had bolted by this time they're also hurting for some star power with i believe some main eventers uh being on the shelf if you don't see steiner here goldberg had the injury uh bret hart had his career ended uh so things like that were were hurting them and we talked about that on our uh on our super brawl assessment too and this just continues on from there. But um, yeah, because it's basically uh, kind of like a mid card um, showcase for these two shows. I guess they have Kidman on there, uh, Vampiro, mm-hmm, um, the wall. Mm-hmm. The wall gets put over. So yeah, I guess it is just like a mid card um, um, showcase, which is actually more of the better stuff. Because I liked uh, the wall and Bam Bam was really short, but I liked how they sold him as a monster uh, really well. That's true. They they did a decent job putting him over. He also uh, takes out Crowbar later in the show, like throws him off the stage, and they do the whole uh, canned concern thing with Owen Voice and uh, trying to bring updates on his condition throughout throughout the night, sort of stuff. Which uh, to to mixed effect, I would say, uh, but. The Wall was one of those guys who you could tell they they had some plans for him, even though they hadn't quite crystallized yet. But uh, things get sort of derailed after this because then in, you talked about Russo uh, with the Russo Mania WrestleMania. Well, he's coming in for his uh, second run in WCW uh, right after this pay per view. Um, they're handing the reins back to him. So, yeah, that's um, kind of our our assessment, our survey of the WCW Uncensored. Were you glad we, we took this journey, Andy? I know I always put you guys uh, through the pay-per-view uh, series, 
Uh, but this <laughs> one was actually this one was actually surprisingly really good. I thought, except for the last one. Oh, the other ones were fun. Um, they're fun shows. Very watchable. I mean, this this isn't stuff that's that's going to be life changing or, or knock your socks off, knock your dick off, knock any part of your anatomy or your clothing off. But they're easy to get through. Very digestible shows. So, uh, and, and that's something we talked about heading into this this episode was how, in a way, uh, uncensored is is kind of, I don't know. I want to say maybe emblematic of what WCW was as a promotion in the Nitro era. So I know Nitro starts in, in late later uh, 1995 in, in September, so uncensored, the, the pay-per-view does precede that. But it's, again, it's going back to kind of what Eric Bischoff's WCW was, where it's, it's kind of this middling pay-per-view. It, it wasn't ever their their best or most highly promoted show but wasn't their you know their dog shit bottom of the barrel pay-per-view show either it always had something that was very sign of the times for for wcw (laughs) you just constantly see these main events with combinations of of hogan and flair and savage and cage matches and just things of that nature that they just kept cycling through, which that's what WCW was, right? This refusal to let go of, of the past and some of these old timers. It's in the spirit of, of trying things different as well. Um, they don't always stick to the gimmick or, or the remit of, of what it was supposed to be, but that's okay. It's still produced pretty fun and, and successful watchable if nothing else outings uh so yeah i was i was um kind of glad we did this and thought it was easier than than some of the other big bench watches <laughs> that we've done uh in episodes past yeah it was more bite size i guess compared to like uh starcades because there was like twice as many Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. yeah th- i mean this is just just six pay-per-views so easy to sort of run through them did you have a uh, a favorite year a favorite overall uncensored yeah it's gonna sound crazy but i mean that's kind of expected coming from me but <laughs> like 97 was my favorite i've probably watched that one the most i actually have all these shows in some form whether it was a vhs tape or a dvd throughout the years and so 97 would be my favorite but now 95 is a pretty strong contender because it does the gimmick stuff and it's just the entertaining crap because I guess we kind of have uh, the same view on like WCW. Uh, we'll mm-hmm. kind of overlook the bad stuff as long as it entertained us, and that's what '95 does well. Yeah, I, I I think you're right in that '95 is maybe the most faithful to the theme of what this was supposed to be. Uncensored. Uh, uh, my voice is gonna go. <laughs> <laughs> if I keep that up, where they had just a lot of off the wall shit, even though it's not super violent the way that they were kind of playing it up this this whole thing to be, you had some really unorthodox and in a lot of cases super just whack matches. Uh, Ninety nine is is sort of in there as well, and again just uh, playing to what uncensored was was billed as being but i would say 97 is just my favorite in terms of uh just the quality from from top to bottom and and just most enjoyable to watch you know glacier and and mortis when when that's far from your worst match and actually one of the better matches on the card that's that's really saying something so uh I don't know. I, I probably sound like a broken record, always giving it up for, for 97. But, I mean, this is not me speaking through nostalgia goggles. I wasn't watching this shit in 97. I didn't come in until, come back in until a little bit later. So I, I'm sort of seeing this stuff with fresh eyes, fresher eyes, maybe, and uh, and realizing kind of what I missed out on. Oh, and speaking of that, uh, when you mentioned... Um, Glacier and Mortis. I just had like a the light bulb went on in my head, 
And like, it's not that I forgot this guy was there, but when we were talking about it earlier, I overlooked that guy, the sinister minister guy who was with Tajiri and Mikey Whipwreck was that James Vandenberg guy uh, who mm, was with James Vandenberg. Yes. Um, so he's always hanging around like the freaks or something mm-hmm. because yeah, mm-hmm. he's got that uh, Mortis and Wrath, and then ECW. Uh, he's got kind of the uh, it was kind of like more of like a satanic thing or right. something, and then he did it with Abyss later as James Mitchell, right? Yes, yep, James Mitchell. He had the uh, the great uh, green tie here at uh, ninety seven on censors to to complement uh, the ring attire of of Mortis. So, yeah, I, I, he's a guy that, that I certainly overlook too, but um. It, that's just that whole thing with the karate fighters, Mortal Kombat, whatever they were going for type thing with, with that mix of guys. You could tell it would have been the big craze or the big push of the promotion if if not for the NWO. Um, I, I think that would have gotten a lot more focus. Hard to see what the end game of something like that might have been. I mean, what are they going to be vying for titles? Just I don't know, the the storyline, the angle, didn't really lend itself to sort of traditional wrestling booking, but so be it. Uh, that's maybe our, our tangent for the episode. Maybe, maybe we'll expand on that later. I don't know if we could uh, necessarily devote an entire episode to the uh, faux Mortal Kombat angle of the late 90s. <laughs> Or that would be a whole uh, show in itself, uh, those like C and D storylines of '97. Because what mm. the fuck was going on with Jeff Jarrett, Mongo, and Deborah? They were kind of <laughs> going back and forth the same way, like the never-ending thing. And then you had the never-ending Kevin Sullivan and like Benoit feud because they were feuding at the start of the year because they were on a Clash of the Champions, like fighting. And then you had them at Super Brawl in that mix match with uh, Jacqueline. And woman in there, and then they're mm-hmm. still going into the summer. So that feud was like a year long, if you remember that, mm-hmm. because they yeah. had the whole dusty thing of the lady in the men's bathroom, Great American Bash in '96, and then it comes around a whole year later, and they finally blow it off at Bash at the Beach. So it's like you had all those weird like C and D stories that like were going C and D stories of WCW that uh, didn't get as much attention or or aren't as well remembered due to the higher profile NWO main event type stuff. Maybe, uh, maybe that's something to take a look at, but this being perhaps a C and D list pay-per-view series, I think we are ready to put it to bed, but we still have some business to take care of here on this outing. Hmm, how do we do this? I, I kind of want to hand it over to you, Andy, because we're going to be doing something a little bit different for our next show. Yeah, it was actually, this was my idea, and talking about maybe you you uh, kind of slacking off at work and not really being as productive. <laughs> I may have not have been as productive at work with work-related stuff, but over the last week or so, I've been productive at work in a different way. Like, I had a, I was brainstorming, like, We've done, like, the format of the show seems to have been, like, two into doing pay-per-view series. Like, we have to do all the Super Brawls, all the Starcades, now all the Uncensored. Well, I thought of something that could make it more fun for us and also maybe more fun to listen to. WCW, they had a lethal lottery, and they would kind of, like, draw out the matches or, like, a battle bowl thing, you know, um, the battle bowels. Yes, the, the only matches I have refused to watch, <laughs> no matter how hard they, they are pushed. <laughs> so I kind of um, had a thought along that line. Well, maybe we could leave the next couple shows up to chance and do our own version of a lethal lottery. And I kind of ask our past guests, a few of them, if they would be up for this too. And now that we've had kind of a good uh, pool of guests, kind of like a who's who of the, of the Place to Be Nation on here, Now we're going to do our own Lethal Lottery, where putting some topics into a hat, which is actually Big Bubba's hat that went out in the crowd. I went and found it. Oh, yeah. His match was Sting at at, uh, the inaugural Uncensored. Yeah, he lost his hat. 
So I put some topics into uh, this hat, and I'm going to kind of draw one of the topics out and then redraw uh, because of a WCW, they drew like partners. Well, we're going to partner up one of our guests um, with a future topic. And then yeah. uh, should, I, should I read off the topics or do you want me yeah, to read yeah. them off? We have a few topics that uh, Tim and I have kind of discussed and kind of like I kind of came up with a couple and he kind of gave me some feedback. So in the drawing, we have Scott Hall. There's also Brett the Hitman Clark. There's mm. uh, tag teams, the NWO. Uh, there's guest choice because I thought of uh, with the uh, spin the deal, they had like a uh, spinner's choice where they That's could right. choose. So there's that. There's also Hosses, all about the big men of WCW, uh, mm. the giant, Vader, the boss, man, because he's big, and then um, maybe the Yete. So we could kind of mm. run the whole um, the whole uh, field of Hosses throughout WCW's history. Without further ado, I'll just kind of uh, shuffle the hat. This is not gimmicked, by the way. In the spirit of WCW... It is not gimmicked. I would not do that because WCW no. didn't gimmick their wheel or their drawings. Keep ourselves honest. So if we get best coal miners glove matches, we're we're gonna just have to roll with it. Okay, I drew out one. I'm gonna unfold it, and it's the NWO. Oh, cue the porno music. Here we go. Hmm, this is the big time. All right, so we've got our next topic. We're gonna be talking. The NWO, the faction, the faction. Uh, who are we going to be talking about the NWO with? Um, we've got four guys in the drawing who have um, uh, stepped up, and I've kind of convinced that who'd like to be a part of it. Okay, who are who are our, who's in the pool here? Uh, the field is Greg. And we've got Greg Phillips, Travis Banks from the Super Brawl Part One and Two. Okay, very good. There's also. Todd Weber. Oh, yes, the manager, Todd Weber. And also Andrew Reich from our a previous very, episode, all about 1994 pay-per-views. Our very good friend, Andrew. Yes, let's see here. Okay. The winner is Greg. Greg Phillips. Greg Phillips, come on down. You're going to be talking the New World Order on Survey Says in our next episode. So uh, he's already tentatively agreed to this. Yes, you said. He, he's not going to say no. Um, no, I asked all the guys um, whether they were up for it, and um, Greg seemed uh, he seemed positively page about it. Excellent. This is this is going to be fun. Very good. We've, we've left it up to the fates, you know, and, instead of uh, – Going back and forth on, on what we want to talk about, not sure, wishy-washy, how about this, eh, I'm not really feeling it. We, we've let the we, we've let Big Bubber's hat decide it for us. <laughs> oh, Outstanding. Man. Well, I'm going to be looking forward to that. I think that kind of brings our proceedings to a close here. Is there anything else you'd, you'd like to uh, promote or, or put over, brother, before we get out? No, I'm good. Uh, stay tuned to the Place to Be pop feed where you can uh, listen to Tim Capel and his uh, new uh, ventures. Oh, that's true, yes. Excellent. Have we got any uh, dinner and a movies? Any any movies for for guys who might possibly conceivably hypothetically like movies anything coming up here on the superstation well yeah because it's coming up at 705 it looks like it's about 704 so we got a break for dinner and a movie with peter weller ernie hudson meg foster in leviathan leviathan oh that's a good one stay tuned for that folks uh here on on the superstation tbs or or we might be on tnt i'm not entirely sure but for Andy Helene, Andy Savage Helene, I am Tim Capel. We gotta go! <laughs> Ooh.